conic section. Let's take two hollow cones, one of them an upside down copy of the other. We'll place them so that their apexes, or tips, touch, forming an hourglass shape. Then let's imagine that each cone extends infinitely away from its apex. What we are left with is an object called a double cone. Now we'll take a plane, which is an infinite flat sheet, and we'll place it in this space. This plane will intersect the double cone at a certain set of points. The set of intersection points is known as a conic section, or conic for short. These were considered by the ancient Greeks. For now, let's say that the plane does not pass through the double cone's vertex. In that case, there are three possible types of conic sections. The first is the ellipse, which can be obtained with a plane whose slope is gentler than that of the cone. A circle can also be considered an ellipse, though it is sometimes considered separately. The second type of conic section is the parabola, a U-shape that's formed when the plane has the same slope as one side of the double cone. The third type is the hyperbola, formed by a plane that's steeper than the double cone. It consists of two parts, known as the hyperbola's branches. If we do allow the plane to pass through the vertex, we get a conic known as a degenerate conic. This can be a point, a line, or a pair of lines. The lines in question can be either parallel or intersecting. Every conic section can be described in Cartesian coordinates by a certain equation in terms of x and y. Some simple examples are a parabola described by y equals x squared, a circle described by x squared plus y squared equals 1, and a line described by x equals 0. Now let's take the parabola equation and move everything to the left-hand side, resulting in y minus x squared equals 0. The expression y minus x squared is a polynomial in two variables, and the equation states that this polynomial is equal to 0 if and only if the point x, y is a part of the parabola. The set of points composing the parabola is known as the polynomial's zero set. As another example, we can rearrange the circle equation to x squared plus y squared minus 1 equals 0. So the circle consists of the zero set of the polynomial x squared plus y squared minus 1. In general, a curve which is defined as a two-variable polynomial's zero set is called an algebraic curve. Lemniscuit of Bernoulli. Let's start by choosing a positive real number, which we'll call c. In the Cartesian plane, draw the two points on the x-axis that are each a distance of c from the origin. Each point will be called a focus point, or focus for short, and foci for plural. We'll label these f1 and f2. Now, pick some point p and determine how far it is from each focus. These distances will be called pf1 and pf2 respectively. If pf1 times pf2 is equal to c squared, then we will fill it in. Doing this for all possible points in the plane, we will get a figure 8 shape. This is called the Lemniscuit of Bernoulli, named after Swiss mathematician and physicist Daniel Bernoulli. It is an algebraic curve, as it can be represented by this equation. Now let's consider what happens if we let c equals the square root of 2 over 2. The resulting Lemniscuit is given by this equation and it passes through the points negative 1, 0, and 1, 0. If we take the arc length of this lemniscuit, the distance along the entire curve, and divide it by its width, we get a number known as the lemniscuit constant, about 2.62. This is denoted by a cursive Greek letter pi. It is equal to half the lemniscuit's arc length. However, it is worth noting that some mathematicians say that 2 pi, the arc length of the entire lemniscuit, is the Lemniscuit constant instead. For those of you who know that the arc length of the entire unit circle is 2 times regular pi, and that this is sometimes denoted as tau, and called the circle constant, this should sound very familiar to you. The Lemniscuit of Bernoulli is a special type of Cassini oval. A Cassini oval is a shape defined by two foci, where the product of distances to those foci remains constant for every point on the shape. This is similar to the definition of an ellipse, but with a Cassini oval, the product of the distances is taken, rather than the sum. Every Cassini oval is an algebraic curve, given by this equation. Which of Agnesi? 
In the Cartesian plane, let's call the origin O, and let's pick some point on the positive y-axis and call it M. We'll draw a circle so that the line segment OM is a diameter of the circle. Then we'll draw the tangent line to the circle at the point M. A tangent line is a line that just barely touches a curve at a single point, serving as an approximation of the curve near that point. Now we can pick any point A on the circle other than O, and we will draw a line passing through both O and A. Since this line touches the circle at two distinct points, it is called a secant line. The aforementioned lines will intersect at a point N. Now we'll draw a line through N that's parallel to OM, and a line through A that's perpendicular to OM. These two lines intersect at a point P. And with that, we have a point P on our curve. Repeating this process for every possible choice of A on our circle, we get a curve known as the Witch of Agnesi. It is named after Italian mathematician, philosopher, theologian, and humanitarian Maria Gaetana Agnesi. If we call the radius of our circle A, then we can write this equation for the witch, which can be rewritten as this. As this is equivalent to a polynomial equation, the which is an algebraic curve. One case where the which arises is in probability theory. A continuous random variable is a variable with uncountably infinitely many possible values. The probability that such a variable falls within a given interval can be determined using a function called probability density function. One example is the probability density function of the Cauchy distribution. Graphing it gives us the which. Folium of Descartes. Here's a Latin language lesson. The Latin word folium means leaf. That concludes our Latin language lesson. The folium of Descartes is given by the equation x cubed plus y cubed minus 3axy equals 0 for some value a. It is named after French philosopher, scientist, and mathematician René Descartes, who first came up with it in 1638. It is remembered for an event that occurred involving Descartes and another French mathematician, Pierre de Fermat. Descartes wanted to test out Fermat's claim that the latter had discovered a method of finding tangent lines. So Descartes challenged Fermat to do so for any arbitrary point on the folium of Descartes. Let's take up Descartes' challenge ourselves. Luckily today, we have the benefit of calculus to help us out. In particular, we must use a technique known as implicit differentiation, which allows us to find the slope of the tangent line to any point on an implicit curve. Let's take our equation from before. Now we take the derivative with respect to x on both sides. The right-hand side simplifies to zero. On the left, remembering that a is a constant, we can apply linearity. Using the power rule, the first term is 3x squared. As for the second term, since we are treating y as a function of x, we will use the power and chain rules. The last term requires the product rule. With all the calculus out of the way, all we need is some algebra to solve for dy dx. Now, for any point x0, y0 on the curve, finding the tangent line requires using point-slope form. With that, we have solved a problem that Descartes could not. However, Fermat could, leaving him the winner of Descartes' challenge.